hi, thank you uh, for your patience as I got my technology working on my end. This is Suzanne Baylog. Um, two announcements. First, there is a new event um, that's been added to our spring offerings. Uh, you can find it on our CU Museum calendar, but on Monday, April 25, uh, podcaster and author Florence Williams will talk about the healing powers of nature and discuss how uh, the outdoors and being outdoors can help us heal um, mentally and psychologically and emotionally. Um, and uh, please, uh, we highly encourage CU students who might be um, experiencing some stress or anxiety this time of, uh, with finals coming up um, that you tune in. It's designed um, and hoping to reach CU students, but everybody is welcome. And this is huge. Um, you're the first to be hearing it publicly from us, uh, but the CU Museum, as you know, is home to the only Triceratops skull in Boulder, Colorado, but things are about to change. I'd like to invite you all to come in and say hello or a fond farewell to the only Triceratops uh, on CU campus. We will be sending out more information very soon. Um, and the Triceratops has been such a huge presence in Paleo Hall and has witnessed so many amazing AIA events, but it is on loan to us from the Smithsonian Institution and it will be going back soon after graduation. So just wanna encourage people to come on, stop, it, stop by, say hello or goodbye to this amazing specimen and um, uh, to let people know if you do come to the May AIA event with Dr. Will Taylor, you can see it then because uh, we will be hosting that event live and on Zoom from Paleo Hall. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm excited to hear about Pompeii and I will toss it to Dimitri. Okay, I'm unmuted. I think I'm okay. Yeah. Uh, great. Welcome everybody. Um, <laughs> Uh, here in person and um, on Zoom. Um, I'm Dimitri Nikasis. I'm the chair of the Classics Department, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's proceedings. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker, but before I do that, I wanted to um, uh, make a couple of plugs. The first thing is that this talk is jointly sponsored by the Archaeological Institute of America and the CU Museum of Natural History. Uh, these, all of the AIA talks are, are jointly run with um, the Museum of Natural History, and this is um, a very productive uh, relationship. We're really happy about all of that. So um, thank you to Suzanne and the CU Museum for all of their support of these lectures. I also wanted to make a, a, a brief plug for the Archaeological Institute of America. If you haven't heard of the AIA, it's the uh, largest and oldest archaeological um, organization. And what makes it distinctive, I think, from other kinds of professional organizations is that it has a very significant outreach uh, component to it. So um, talks like this are a big part of that outreach. That is to say, national speakers coming in and giving lectures to local audiences. Um, obviously, with Zoom, we've gotten used to that, uh, you know, being able to go to all kinds of talks uh, nationally and internationally. Um, but the AIA has been doing this for, for decades, um, even prior to that, and, and is continuing to do that. Uh, now, using Zoom also as a way of bringing lectures to many people. There are um, scholarships for students. There are, there's research um, money for researchers uh, that supports archaeology worldwide. So the, although the AIA is for professionals often associated with the Mediterranean, in fact, the organization is really doing uh, what it can to support archaeology worldwide. Um, and there's advocacy um, as part of the AIA as well. So advocating for protection of archaeological and material heritage and cultural heritage worldwide. Um, so it's, it's a fantastic organization. And if you're interested in joining, the best thing to do is to go to archaeological.org. Um, and you can find more information about becoming a member, um, getting Archaeology Magazine, um, that sort of thing. And there are reduced rates for students, um, importantly, for the students who are listening. Okay, two more plugs, and then I will introduce our speaker. One is that the next AIA lecture, um, you may have seen it flashing on your screen, is going to be on May 4th at 7 p.m., that's a Wednesday, um, in the Museum of Natural History in the Paleontology Hall. And that lecture will be by William Taylor, who is a professor here at CU Boulder. Uh, his lecture is called Rethinking the Human Horse Story in the American West, 
an archaeological perspective. Um, that will be the last lecture of our academic year. So May 4th, that's a Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the CU uh, Museum of Natural History. Okay. Uh, our speaker is not the only distinguished uh, Roman archaeologist who is coming to see you uh, this month. Um, so on April 18th, uh, that is Monday, this coming Monday, Brian Rose, who's the, the James Pritchard Professor of Archaeology at the University of Pennsylvania, will be giving a public lecture uh, at 5.30 p.m. next door in 1B90. Um, and that lecture is entitled Archaeology, Museums, and War in the 21st Century. Um, so Brian Rose this Monday at 5.30 p.m. Okay. I think that's it as far as the preliminaries go. So I can introduce our speaker and I promise I will be quick. Uh, so our speaker tonight is Professor Jeremy Hartnett. He's Professor of Classics and the Andrew and Ann Ford Chair in the Liberal Arts at Wabash. College. Um, he's been teaching there since 2004. Um, and in fact, uh, I don't know if I should say when we've met, but Jeremy and I met even before that um, at the University of Michigan, where he did his uh, doctoral degree, and I was just a, a little undergrad. Um, uh, so we've known each other for a really long time. We've been friends for a very long time. Um, Jeremy's a specialist in Roman art and archaeology and social history as well. Um, and he's worked at uh, studied sites in Italy, including Pompeii, Herculaneum, and Rome. And what's, I won't go into a great amount of detail, but what I think is really um, interesting and distinctive about Jeremy's work is that he's interested in um, individuals. So um, not just thinking about um, elites and emperors, but his first book was about Pompeian street life. Um, his new book project is about um, a specific Roman individual whose life and afterlife we can trace in some great detail. He's interested in writing a book about um, sort of non-aristocratic um, Roman uh, individuals. And in all of there's a, there's a focus on the individual, um, the context of that individual's life, um, the sort of texture of their lived experience, uh, the way that everyday Romans constructed worlds that made sense to them, right? That, that took a complex and confusing world and turned it into something sensible and comprehensible. Um, and in all of his work, there's a kind of mixture of, of archeology span and history, um, art and um, welcome. Um, so there's a really kind of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary way of thinking about the Roman world. Um, that cross that crosses a cuts a, across um, you know sort of traditional domains of study right cuts across archaeology and art um, and history um, and literature in fact as well um, so he's a very well rounded um, and interdisciplinary scholar and it's partially for that reason that we wanted to invite him here to see you um, to give this lecture um, so I think I've babbled on enough. And I can ask Jeremy to rescue me and come up here on the stage. Jeremy. Let me make sure I can get the technology working and then I'll get started. There we go. I thought I had it. Um, thanks to Dimitri uh, for the invitation for the introduction, and thanks so much for the invitation to come and speak here, and also for the hospitality. Thanks, um, Dimitri and, and Sarah and Travis. Um, I've already had a great time. Uh, it's just over twenty-four hours uh, being here. I'm looking forward to um, more adventures uh, tomorrow. Um, for those of you who are students who might be listening in or in the room, um, let me say that become going to lectures like this 
were one of the reasons that I wanted to get into this field in the first place. And Archaeology Magazine is a fantastic gateway. So if you're a student, um, look to uh, become a member, a student member of the Archaeological Institute of America. Um, tonight's lecture is actually an endowed lecture in honor of uh, Jim Russell, an, an emeritus professor at the University of British Columbia, um, who is one of the greats and in fact, uh, president of the AIA. So we should give a little bit of thought to him. So my talk tonight, let me say that I tend to roam while I'm lecturing. And if I end up going too far away from the, um, keep talking, keep talking, okay. If I end up going too far away from the microphone, if people on the Zoom would send uh, a quick note in the chat uh, to Sarah, and then she'll shoo me back towards uh, the, the microphone. All right, I think we've got everything covered. All right, as my title would uh, suggest, I'm gonna be talking a bit about Pompeii and not so much uh, the grand narratives, but taking us down to the street side texture. I think this is important because when we normally think of uh, a Roman city, we can think instead of the grand spaces, the places like uh, the Colosseum, uh, the forum that you see in front of you. And there's a reason that those kind of places dominate our view of Roman cities, because Rome itself largely has maintained a big complexes like this, and not much by way of like the regular urban texture, since it's been built over uh, year after year, millennium after uh, millennium. In fact, one of the ways that you might even imagine this is through a uh, through an image of uh, of what Rome might have looked like from Gian Battista Piranesi. This was his idea of what Rome would look like if you were to peel away the medieval and Baroque and Renaissance uh, periods. And you can see that it's a city that is exclusively a monumental city. There is no daily urban uh, texture. And I think that's a dangerous thing because it makes Rome a city of, of senators and emperors rather than a city of the other uh, 900,000, 999,000 uh, people who dwelt in it in the ancient world. Now, we know that there must have been like a really vibrant uh, everyday life for people outside of the Forum and the Colosseum. And we can see it if we go to places like modern day Naples. And I just wanna give you a couple of vignettes to give you a sense of what might have happened on the everyday streets of, of, of a regular city. You can see what people do. They, they converse heatedly. They sell contraband. They carry coffins and eat pizzas. <laughs> Let me zoom in on one particular street. This is Via San Biagio dei Librai, also known as Spacca Napoli because it, it divides Naples in two. And here again, we can see a great variety of different people and activities jam-packed in a very small space. You can see, for example, on the left-hand side, somebody hawking souvenirs and snacks. In the middle, you can see a family walking uh, together. On the right, somebody watching everyone uh, pass by. And in the back left, you can see people where people might pray to the Virgin. This makes the point that streets are vibrant, busy places populated by everyone across the whole social spectrum. And because they are narrow, I should say that this street, Spacanopoli, maintains the dimensions and orientation of the ancient Roman street, which must be, must be replicating a lot of the activities that went on here, or at least sort of two meters down in antiquity. It makes the point that streets are lively, vibrant places. Now, if we can't get a sense of Roman street life from a place like Rome, where can we get it? Well, and the answer is gonna be Pompeii. Um, because Pompeii, unlike Rome, wasn't subject to the sort of normal urban process of, of convenience stores uh, replacing corner shops and uh, modern apartment buildings and Renaissance palazzi over ancient apartment buildings, we get a whole bunch of different urban texture. Thanks, of course, to the famous eruption of Mount Vesuvius 
in 79 CE. Unlike the urban process, volcanoes are extremely democratic, right? They get everyone and everything. Everybody's garbage is, uh, is preserved. And so we can get that daily texture. And we can sometimes get up close and personal with some of the people who lived in these cities. Here you're seeing a cast of a body of a, of a young boy. You can even make out the folds of his clothing um, uh, as he breathes his last uh, breath in 79 CE. Now, I'm not gonna try to tackle all of Pompeii. I'm gonna instead talk about one particular corner but in order to introduce it, I actually have to tell you a little bit of a story from early 20th century Pompeii. There's a guy named Vittorio Spinazzola who came along and tried to basically upend a lot of what was going on with Pompeian archeology. span Usually people excavated either block by block or house by house. And you can see in the upper part of this slide, um, the parts that were excavated before he came along. They're all the parts that are, are shaded. So you can see most of the Western half of the city and then the amphitheater in the East. And Spinozola said, you know, this is bananas. We don't need to just do this. We can get a sense of the vitality of urban life just by digging one street. And so he set out to dig about a half a kilometer stretch of the Via della Abondanza. That's a modern name, the street of abundance. And the photo in the bottom, it was taken from near his starting point. You might make out in the distance, the arches of the amphitheater, and that long, what we call it, gorge, artificial gorge, uh, along the street is essentially a photographic trophy of the end results of his uh, project. And in fact, when Vittorio Spinazzola sunk his very first trench, he came down precisely on the corner that we're going to study uh, tonight. This is an intersection, um, you can see the red arrow down below that um, is along this busy street and is gonna give us a sense of a whole bunch of different stories that are gonna play out. I want you to pay attention uh, to this slide, in particular, the painting at the very far right end where you see a couple of bronze vessels. They're gonna show up in just a second. All right, this is an, you, may, you see them there? All right, this is an image of Spinazzola's first trench. And you can see he came down specifically in this uh, spot. We've got the full um, assortment of his team there, whether it's um, animal or human, uh, excavating this particular corner. Now, when we look at this corner, it was basically an everyday commercial street. It was far from Rome's civic and uh, political and religious and commercial center of the Forum. It was also far from its entertainment district at the southern end of the city, but that didn't mean that this wasn't an important spot or that little traffic went by it. In fact, we have ways to assess the amount of traffic. One thing we can do is, in fact, look at the wheel ruts that were worn into the street bed. Um, Roman carts, wagons, let's leave aside chariots, that's like a, a Hollywood invention. Um, had iron rims and their continual passing along these uh, streets wore these little valleys into, um, into the roadbed and even on occasion into the stepping stones. If you look at the close right side of the leftmost uh, stepping stone, you can see where it's worn away. Um, and so our scholars have of course tried to uh, map these back to the wheel ruts across the whole city. And where you see our corner indicated by the red arrow has some of the deepest routes, as well as most of the Via della Bondanza running to the northeast and out of the city. Another index of how busy this street would be is, is the variety of different things that could draw people to this spot. This wasn't just like having a factory where people uh, you know, punched in at nine o'clock and punched out at five o'clock. There were a lot of things to draw people to this. It might be the neighborhood altar. It might be the fountain and the pressure release tower on the south side of the street. It might have been the industry, the light industry that happened here. It could have been the very big houses that were around this corner, the bar or tavern, and then some of the smaller houses 
that also were part and parcel of this uh, neighborhood. One thing to notice then is not just the sort of diversity on a local level, but the lack of zoning uh, by our imagination uh, that occurred here. And also the fact that you've got cheek by jowl, um, uh, industry, commerce, small houses, bigger houses. It's not like there was a poor person section and a rich person section of Pompeii. Everybody was mixed and mingled uh, together. Oh, and I even left out a workshop there for a little bit more uh, industry. So that might have drawn people uh, to this spot. What I want to do in my time today is to tell five stories that unfold around this intersection. And I want you to think away your nor normal idea of a neighborhood where we have like a June and Ward Cleaver, I recognize I'm dating myself here, who live behind a white picket fence and uh, exist in, in peaceful bono me with all of their neighbors. Instead, I'll only prime the pump a little bit and say, as you're hearing these five stories, I want you to see how contentious, how contentious the interaction was among the people in this neighborhood. Roman society was deeply invested in hierarchy. The street, by contrast, was a place where they were absent a lot of the normal like ritual or architectural framing devices. If you went to the theater or went to the amphitheater, you could tell where you stacked up based on where you were seated because of your like legal status. In the street, anybody is allowed to go. So how did Romans take this chaos and tame it? How did they use the, st the street as a, a stage to perform their, how they wanted to be received before the biggest audience possible? Those are some of the questions I want you to think about as we go through five different stories. I'm gonna start at the altar that is at the left-hand side of the box on the screen. So now we're zoomed in a little bit. You can see there's a fountain in the foreground, an altar behind, and then a big house door, we think, and then a bar that I'm gonna look at in a second. So let's zoom in on this altar. You can see on the right-hand side, an altar as well as a broad fresco that was behind it. This altar, we believe, was at the center of a civic, political, and religious unit called a vicus. We think that Pompeii, like Rome and other cities, was subdivided into these neighborhoods. And each of these neighborhoods had as its religious focal point an altar where people would sacrifice to the neighborhood gods. Now, one of the interesting things about the officials at a place like this is that they weren't drawn necessarily from the top ranks of society, but their names and some of our evidence from elsewhere suggest that they were either slaves or freedmen, that is former slaves. And we think that they probably built the altar and definitely, as I hope to show you, commissioned the painting that was behind it. The painting essentially is going to try to justify and underscore their important position in this neighborhood. And you, we can call it one of these uh, neighborhood altars, both because it's an altar at a corner and also because it has the typical protective snakes uh, lining up above it. Now, if we can, we're going to go to the upper right, the bottom left, and then the upper left, and we're going to see how these different paintings try to justify the spots of these neighborhood officials. So what we're looking at first is the painting that's in the upper right, and this shows the neighborhood officials at their greatest moment of glory in the Roman religious calendar, the feast of the crossroads gods, the Compitalia, when they despite being slaves or freedmen, got to wear a special toga, the toga praetexa, which had a red sash around the outside of it. And you can see they're in their moment of glory because they've got their togas pulled up over their heads because they're sacrificing at an altar. And the guy second from the left is even playing the pipes and there's some sort of sacrifice happening immediately on top of that cylindrical altar. We know it's the Feast of the Compitalia, not another one, because of those small dolls that hang from the sides and the front of the altar. Our literary sources suggest that those dolls were fixed there and everybody in the neighborhood would, hold, would hang over their threshold, either another doll or a ball of wool in order to indicate the freed or the slave members of their society. So this is like the 
the, the centerpiece of neighborhood identity. It's fascinating then that these guys show themselves at their moment of glory. And we have to think of this not just as uh, a reflection, well, not just as a representation of what happened, but of course, a reflection of what happened when they in real life were gathered around uh, this particular spot and had the attention of neighborhood uh, dwellers uh, focused on it. I should say that if you see a little bit in the watercolor painting on the bottom side on top of the altar, it's because Spinazzola and company actually found chicken bones on top of this when they excavated. Now, you might be able to see a couple of things about this uh, depiction, even in the grotty state that exists now. And the upper left of both images, you might be able to make out a little bit of a plaque. And this gives us a sense of who these guys were. And in fact, names the four neighborhood officials uh, who commissioned this painting. Their names, Aesclopiades, Victor, Circassus, and Constance, reflect the type of names that we'd expect of slaves. But here, it's important in the street to name yourself and to put your best face forward. It wasn't just these guys who were happy to do this, however. In the bottom image, you can, I've, been, I've been able to make out actually about seven different layers of paint. If you look in the upper image and see how there's a ghostly figure behind the altar, he wasn't meant to be there. That's coming through from the previous version of the painting. In other words, each successive group of neighborhood officials updated the, the paintings, personalized them probably with their own name. Now you might be thinking, if you're an everyday Roman, who are these people who, uh, who are slaves or freedmen who occupy the liturgical spotlight and get to have their names splashed across this? Our guys actually anticipated this and therefore tried to uh, summon realms beyond just the, uh, the immediate and the local. On the bottom left-hand side of this mural, they showed the, their imperial patron, the first Roman emperor, Augustus, who was a guy who elevated the, uh, the status of these neighborhood officials. So they go from the local to the imperial. And then when we look above the genius of Augustus, we can see the celestial realm as well, where we've got, uh, the, we've got 12 Olympian gods shown here. Um, in their attributes and in terms of who's shown, they're basically encyclopedic when it comes to um, otherworldly power. But the ones who get center billing inside the red square are ones of intensely local interest. On the left is Hercules, said to be the mythical founder of Pompeii, because he led a parade, a pompa, through the city. This is where you get our word pomp and circumstance. In the middle, we have Venus Pompeiana, the patron goddess of the city. And on the right, we've got Mercury, uh, a fittingly commercial god of commerce for this busy business street. So we only have one other painting of these collection of 12 gods. And in the center of that one, they put the Capitoline Triad, the three most important gods of the Roman pantheon. Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva smack dab in the same position. Our folks have been relegated to the margins in this other painting. In other words, what our local magistrates have done is try to pick up and spotlight figures who are of the greatest local importance. So let's take stock. You've got slaves or freedmen maybe getting the side eye from other folk, but what are they doing? They're trying to... Uh, if, if their authority was questioned, they're tapping into realms beyond uh, theirs. They're creating a gigantic funnel of authority that channels, um, that channels the power from the celestial realm down through the imperial realm and into their particular location. All right, let me get to story two. We're gonna move from the altar just a little bit to the east and to a bar, a bar opening uh, that is just beyond that big house doorway. This bar was, was like a lot of bars at Pompeii. In fact, I should hold off on calling it a bar. It was an eating and drinking establishment because if I say bar, you start to think of like, um, or a saloon or a tavern, each of those things carries their own uh, message along with them. If I call it a saloon, you're imagining swinging Western doors. 
let's call it eating and drinking establishment. How did these things work? Well, they had embedded in the counter three large, this one has three large earthenware vessels. They most likely held uh, dry goods. And then there was a way for these places to prepare cooked food or to serve wine. You can see that this one was stocked with like two dozen amphorae. It was ready for a party. Each of those had the capacity of 28 liters, which is the capacity of the smallest of those vessels that's inset in the counter. And you can see if you wanted to have your wine served warm, maybe like mulled wine as you'd have in the winter, um, you, there was a facility to, um, to heat the water. Now, um, we suspect that whoever worked here dished the wine into some sort of uh, vessel that was then poured into individual glasses. There was even an iron tripod, so they might have been able to stew uh, legumes with like a, you know, a knuckle of pork or something like that. That's our best guess on what was served in these spots. Now, when I say eating and drinking establishment, um, I'm, I'm going through some peripheries to get around what might be happening here. And in particular, I want to avoid the word uh, restaurant or bar, because when we start to think about restaurant, we start to think about like sit down service. And it doesn't seem like that's what happened. Instead, we have about 160 eating and drinking establishments of this sort at Pompeii. Now, if we do a little bit of math and say, all right, Pompeii, a city of 12 to 15,000 inhabitants inside of the walls, we've got about 30% of the city that hasn't yet been excavated. Then our math comes out as one of these eating and drinking establishments for every, I don't know, 60 to 75 uh, inhabitants of the city. I don't know how that compares to um, Boulder and the number of eating and drinking establishments, but that strikes me as a really high uh, number, a really high density. And in fact, um, the places that have the greatest um, amount of straight, similar like density of street side eating or drinking establishments are in the developing world. Now I recognize that these are street food vendors who may be something different from what I'm talking about here. And we also have to bear in mind that we're missing out on some of the ambulant vendors who would hawk their wares while they were circulating around the city in Pompeii. But I'm giving you a sense of how this is not something that would be for the rich and the elite, but instead the sort of place where everyday folk would go to grab a bite, either because they don't have cooking facilities in the house, they're worried about the dangers of fire, the annoyances of heat and smoke, or maybe they're drawn by the opportunity to have some social contact outside of the sort of domestic strictures of a house, even if they even if you call it a house, if they have a room where they board it, or they're a renter in uh, a part of a house or they're a slave in another big house and have to escape from that sort of spot. All right, so that's what we think these things are. You might notice that this particular eating and drink establishment is plastered with painted endorsements. These are in fact painted endorsements of candidates for Pompey's two major offices. The two co-mayors called the Duumbiri, they kind of <laughs> they, they ran an empire and then they uh, ran out of creativity. The duumvirs means two guys because they're co-mayors. And then they're subsidiaries, uh, e-dials. All right, these are all endorsements for these guys. Let me show you how they work. They start off with the name of the candidate. Then they tell you what office he, and it's exclusively a he, was running for. They add an adjectival descriptor sometimes. And then on occasion, you can see this can be greatly abbreviated, they ask for your vote. Now, this one's kind of anonymous, it says, I ask. But on occasion, we actually have endorsers who say, I, Jeremy, ask that you elect Gaius Lolius uh, Fuscus for uh, Edile. One of the things that can happen at, thanks to these endorsements is we can see where Pompeians expected there to be traffic not just the wheel traffic that we saw from the wheel ruts, but also pedestrian traffic. So for example, this could tell us where they expected people to take shortcuts. If you wanted to go from the forum out the north part of the city, you could see that you wouldn't just follow the main drags. I'm gonna put my, uh, my uh, 
let me use the cursor here, you would instead go up, over, and then you can cut the corner up this alley instead of sticking to the main street over here. All right, back to our corner. There are 19 different endorsements across the front of this uh, eating and drinking establishment, and five of them name the endorser. What's fascinating is that all five endorsers are women. They're the only endorse, endorsers and they're all women. Given the fact that they all have, well, they almost all have foreign names. Um, Igle is a figure of minor Greek myth. Uh, Smyrina named after Smyrna and Ionia. Um, Asalina is the only Latin name, meaning like little donkey. And of course, today you can't go to Italy without like seeing a thousand Marias. But let's remember that in antiquity, it was a Semitic name from the East. So the fact that these women's endorsements are foreign and grouped around this uh, eating and drinking establishment suggests to people that they were probably the people who worked in this bar. We don't know whether they're slave or free, perhaps they were foreign, we don't know a lot of those things. But that shouldn't deter us from thinking a little bit about what kind of knowledge they would have embodied as they were standing at this one spot in the urban structure. Along this busy street, you can imagine them seeing people coming and going. They might hear voices coming out of some of these houses, that these big houses that were nearby. They might eavesdrop on what was happening at the water pump, see who was making sacrifices at the altar, et cetera. If you were new to town, maybe you ask uh, these folk for directions. Um, fascinatingly, when we hear about rumor in the Roman world and where it's supposed to spread, people pinpoint spots, particularly like this one. This is a Roman satirist named Juvenal, and he's giving instructions to a guy who wants to like, keep, ev keep everything on the down low. And, but he says, what kind of secrets can a rich guy keep? You know, you can muzzle the dog, the doorpost, the statues, close the windows, pull the shades, and still, whatever that guy did, second cock crow, that barman down on the corner will know by dawn, together with every other rumor started by the kitchen staff, from head cook to bottle washer. So when Romans want to think about um, <laughs> how to uh, circulate a rumor, they go straight to a spot like this. All right, which makes us start to think about these uh, female endorsers in a different uh, way. The great urban planning maven, uh, Jane Jacobs, gives us a name that might fit for these. She calls them public characters. And she says, basically, they have to talk to lots of different people, and then they spread the news. She says, these people learn and spread the news at retail, and they also deal it essentially at wholesale as well. And this might explain why these women were such uh, hearty endorsers of specific candidates. Now, this didn't insulate them from some unusual practices. We're looking just to the left of the door here at one of the uh, particular endorsements. You can see it endorses a guy named Gaius Julius Plibius. But if you look at the Latin, you can see he's running for duumvir, and he's well enough known to be recognizable just by his initials, right? C-I-P, just like L-B-J, whether I'm talking about the, the president or the basketball star, right? <laughs> um, he's well enough known. And in fact, we know that he lived uh, just about 70 or 80 meters to the east of this. So if he walked from his house to the forum together with his posse, they would have walked immediately by this uh, endorsement. So we've got one of the biggest, most important figures in the city being endorsed by Samirina in this case. And then someone came along, and we don't know who, could it have been Samirina, could it have been Gaius Trulis Polybius, one of his henchmen, we don't know and whitewashed out Smyrina's name. This wasn't a one-off either because we know another woman, another female endorser, just to the west in Kukula, also endorsing Gaius Julius Publius, also had her name whitewashed out. Now, um, scholars and, and, and tour guides have taken these uh, tantalizing threads and woven them into elaborate tapestries of sex and scorn where they imagine these 
uh, this, this uptight uh, politician not wanting to associate himself with these, uh, these bar baits. The truth is we don't know exactly what happened, but I think it speaks to the sort of a potential for explosiveness between the high and the much more modest on a place like Pompeii streets. Smyrna, Asselina, et cetera, were not happy with the result of this to judge from one endorsement a couple of campaigns later that was right above where Smyrna's name was marked out. Now, if you know some Latin, you'll see that the Latin's a little funky here, but it's a collective endorsement as they ask uh, for it. And they say, they ask for you to vote for Gaius Lolius Fuscus for Duum Vir, and they append to the end Nec sine smyrina, and especially smyrina. The message being that if you rub our, out our friend, we're going to come back as a collective and say, and especially her. All right, so that's the end of story two. Now what we're going to do is go back across past the altar, back across that narrow alleyway, and look at a shop facade for, uh, for story three. The shop facade um, is one of the more striking uh, shop facades from Pompeii. You can see it has some deities up in the upper part. And then it has down below representations of two goddesses in uh, potentially favored by the shopkeeper. Now I should say, we don't know exactly what happened in the shop because beyond the facade that Spinazzola excavated, not much more excavation has happened. So we're mostly at the mercy of what has been painted along the front. I'm gonna to go to the right-hand side and then to the left-hand side of the door jams. All right, so here we are on the right-hand uh, side. This isn't, I kind of misspoke. This isn't a goddess. This is a representation of a statue of a goddess together with a whole bunch of her adherents. You can see that it's a statue because uh, there are these very, these, I'm going to use the laser pointer here, features again. You can see that there are these um, basically like sticks that stick out of a uh, plinth uh, that were meant to be shouldered by these four individuals who are dressed alike and are aided by uh, canes. We know this, this goddess based on the uh, lions in front of her as well as the crown that she wears is the, is the Phrygian goddess Sibylle. I need to tell you a little bit about Sibylle uh, before I can explain what's going on here. The year is deep in the third century BCE and Hannibal, the general from uh, Carthage is marauding up and down the Italian peninsula, striking fear into the Romans. And he and the Romans uh, don't know what to do with this guy. So what do they do in response? They, they call upon the Sibylline books and the Sibylline books say, Go and seek out the mother of us all. And like, okay, mother of us all. That's the goddess Sibylle. We can go get her from the northern part of modern day Turkey, uh, Asia Minor. And they go and get her statue, bring it into Rome, plant it on the Palatine Hill, and bingo, bango, everything's okay. And uh, Hannibal is eventually sent packing back to uh, North Africa. They get a little bit more than they bargained for, however, because uh, the adherents of Sibylle's cult uh, were renowned, if we read the Roman sources, to engage in raucous, orgiastic worship of this goddess, um, full of all sorts of like secret rites and, and music and parading around, and even worse to the Roman imagination, their the priests of Sibylle would uh, whip themselves into ecstatic frenzies and then emasculate themselves in, in dedication to the goddess and also in imitation of her consort, Attis. That's where the Romans had had enough. This is like, this is not okay for the Romans. Yet, so why? How does somebody in Pompeii show the goddess Sibylle? And how might they sort of assuage some of the fears that were still a couple, two, three centuries later, and still percolating in different parts of uh, the empire? Well, one thing we can say to start is that Sibylle here has been paired with a uh, representation of another god who 
came from the East, was met with some misgivings initially, and then was incorporated basically unproblematically into the Roman pantheon, namely Dionysus slash uh, Bacchus. But the other thing that we can see is that it's, it's actually the things we cannot see. We do not see a raucous orgiastic dedication to this goddess, but instead a representation that's extremely ordered. We've already seen the four figures who uh, had just set down the statue of uh, Sibylia that they've been parading through the city. We can see uh, three other guys who are the chief priest in the, uh, in the, uh, the right, and then his two adherents as adjutants, including the one on the left who's playing the double pipes, um, flanking the chief priest or two priestesses, and then notice the rest of the group. They're shown in all the multicolored um, polychromatic glory that we know are supposed to be associated with uh, Sibylius worship. We even get some tiny musicians to the left of Dionysus who've got symbols. In other words, we've got an encyclopedic version of Sibylli cults, but one that's extremely ordered. So this is meant to tamp down any misgivings that a viewer might have. The other thing that happened in order to, oops, I'm getting this ahead of myself. Now, we don't know a whole lot about the cult of Sibylle at Pompeii. We have a couple of inscriptions that might suggest that she was worshipped there. Um, if she had a cult that may have been a cult center, it may have been outside the city walls that we haven't discovered. Nevertheless, I want, to I want you to think not just of this as a representation, but let's animate it. And let's imagine uh, there's a procession going down the street. The street that had normally belonged to everybody would be sonically dominated by all the clanging cymbals and, and tambourines and whatnot. Maybe mothers pull their kids uh, across off of the street bed. Um, the kids scamper on top of the fountain to get uh, a better look. And the proprietor of this shop stands proudly in the doorway, um, paying reverence to the statue of his preferred deity. So we have to think about these things as living, um, as potentially living uh, experiences as much as paintings. Now, if some nervousness, anxiety still persisted, our owner, shop owner, seems to have commissioned a painting on the left-hand side of the doorway that would have similarly assuaged any fears. It shows the patron goddess of the city, Venus Pompeiana. And I want you to notice a few things about her. All right, so she is dead smack in the center. We know that it's a Venus Pompeiana because she is associated with seafarers, and there she is with a golden rudder. She's got um, her son, Cupid, um, on a little plinth next to her, and then we've got these bambini flying in from the sides with extra uh, palm branches and a crown. One of the other things that I want you to notice is how heavy her royal purple drapery is. If this was a shop that sold or perhaps dyed cloth, then she's not just an object of reverence. She's also like the spokesmodel for the shop. And for the Romans, mixing commerce and religion was perfectly fine. Goddesses can push product too. But the other thing I think is interesting about beyond those heavy bowls of the woolen cloth is how much jewelry she's got on. She's got a, a tiara, she's got pearl earrings, she's got a, a necklace, she's got rings on every finger. I mean, this is an extraordinary amount of bling, right? That's going to ask, make us ask ourselves, why is she so blinged out? And that's gonna get us to our fourth story. We're gonna go just down the street. So the box on the right was just framing the shop that we we're looking at. We're gonna go past our, a couple of the shop doors, a really nice house door. And then we're gonna to get to another establishment that seems also to have been in the business of producing and definitely selling uh, cloth, including wool. It had some interesting shop paintings on its side, side of its main doorway as well. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a divine scene above a terrestrial scene. In the celestial scene above, we've got Mercury walking out of a temple-like structure, 
with a billowing cloak, money bag, and Caduceus in his two hands, uh, a jaunty hat, and then uh, his accustomed winged uh, footwear there. Down below, we've got a sales scene. It's like, it's like, a, it's like the demon Marcus of the ancient world, uh, where we've got a woman sitting behind a sales counter, and then a customer sitting on the bench on the right, and then spread out uh, are some are some uh, pieces of clothing, as well as some footwear that looks suspiciously like what Mercury is wearing above. Again, God's pushing product. When we go to the right-hand door jam, we see the same representation of something celestial above something terrestrial. I'm going to come back to the terrestrial scene in a second. Let's concentrate on the celestial scene. You might recognize the figure in the center. It's Venus Pompeiana. There she is with her, uh, her gilded um, uh, rudder. She's got Cupid right there, the Bambini flying in from the sides. Again, crown, palm. Again, she's got all sorts of bling. And yet she's shown in a still more extravagant way. She's being pulled by four elephants on a red proud boat. Now, we can't give relative dates to these two uh, dueling vigor, figures of Venus Pompeiana, but this does trigger for us the question of, and perhaps answer the question of why our first Venus Pompeiana was so elegantly dressed. These two seem to be basically competing in their reverence for Pompey's patron goddess. It's like the two car dealerships that each want to have the bigger American flag outside of uh, outside the front. So I think this is a, a way that we can see, even on a very local scale, people are struggling for uh, customers. Now let's go back to the scene down below. This shows not the sales point, but the workshop that led to the sale. And what we're looking at are the three seated figures who are carding wool. They've got some sort of um, prop in the middle that allows them to card the wool. Notice they're really heavily dressed um, uh, in these sort of smocks. And then the figures in the middle who are wearing shorts and very little else. They're doing that because they're making felt. And what they're huddled around in that sort of horizontal uh, figure eight, I guess the infinity symbol, is at the center of that is um, a, a furnace that would be heating the coagulant, like the, the glue that would stick everything together. And what they're doing is taking the, um, I'm gonna get back on the screen. They're taking the fibers and they're rubbing it in the coagulant before they smash it down uh, to make felt. Um, why do you have three carters there? Probably because you're trying to show the scale and for felt makers, probably you're trying to show the scale of the endeavor that is involved. And the figure who's all the way at the right is holding up the final product. And it's a really nice one. It's a, it's a garment that has those red stripes, so it's supposed to be classy. And he, like our neighborhood officials, not content to just merely show up there, but he even wants to name himself. You can see, uh, make out the letters right below his feet. And I've spelled them out. They are very cundus. that's his name, which means in Latin, modest, modest. All right, so he, Mr. Modest, uh, may not live up to his moniker. All right, that ends story four. Let's go to story five. So we've started with A, our, uh, our altar at the crossroads. We looked at B, our eating and drinking establishment. We went C and D, our competing um, cloth producers or purveyors. And now we're going across the streets from B and A, to a house, a house that really wanted people to think that it was a different kind of space. It tried to signal that it was different, partly through its architecture. You can see, if you look up and down the street, there aren't very many segments of uninterrupted wall, but this one has a couple of uninterrupted segments of wall, because most of the other ones are being used for commerce. And this one's distinguished also, also by having a taller doorway that's framed by these cubic capitals. The architecture is screaming, this is a different realm. And that would have been reinforced if you looked into the front door of this house. We know, or at least our sources suggest, 
that Roman house doors were left open through a fair portion of uh, the day. So anybody who was walking by and could peer in would get in some ways a narrative of the whole house. That red line in the bottom left streaks all the way to the garden in the back. And if they looked down, they would be able to see a gorgeous polychromatic uh, mosaic that carpets this whole area. It has very few uh, parallels throughout all of Pompeii. And you're thinking, whoa, holy smokes, this is a classy joint. Wouldn't it be nice to go in there? Until you looked down and what you're greeted by was something other than a welcome mat. Because the very place you were standing was this mosaic which in fact emphasizes the fact that you're standing outside of the doors because it shows two doors. You can see them here and here. And this dog may be a good boy, but he does not showing himself as a good boy, right? He has to be uh, chained up. He's showing his teeth and he's on his haunches ready to spring. If you didn't get the message from those, just look at the military emblems on the door jams here. We've got a double ax as well as some sort of a spear and shield. So we can see that there's a dance of exclusivity, um, uh, invitation, and also exclusion here at this house. It's saying to anybody who may be you know, drinking around the bar, all right, you may be drinking around the bar, but there's a, there's a sweet freaking uh, a garden in here, and there are going to be parties going on around there. You might even have heard them emanating out their music. This wasn't the only way that this house tried to distinguish itself from its neighbors. It, too, had a whole bunch of electoral uh, endorsements along the facade. Sadly, those have uh, crumbled away, but they've been recorded by earlier generations of archaeologists. The one that survives, however, is not along the facade proper, but tucked just inside the doorway. It's elevated out of reach, perhaps, of anybody who wanted to desecrate it. And it's also in verse. It's one of about a handful of poetic endorsements. And it says, Gaius Cuspius is running for Edile. And then it throws around some really important terms. It says, if glory is to be given to someone who's living modestly, to this young man ought the glory he deserves be given. I mean, words like glory aren't thrown around willy-nilly in the Roman world. So this is showing the high stakes of uh, of elections and also encounters in the street. But I really want to draw your attention to an, one of the most important words in this, I think, which is the word modestly, where kunde. That might strike a chord for you, right? Because it was the same as the guy who was holding up the finished product just down the street. If you were standing in front of this door, you would in fact be looking along that red line in the, in the plan on the upper right, looking just oh, 30 meters to that spot. And if you're, a, if you're a Latin student, you know that where kunde could be that adverb modestly, but if you think about it as a noun, it's the vocative form, the form that you say when you wanna get somebody's attention. You don't say, hey, very kunde, so you say, oh, very kunde. So did he, did his ears prick up when he heard this? We know that Romans tended to read aloud. And if he did, did he get the joke that you may be thinking that you're living modestly, but this is the guy who's actually living modestly. All right, so let's take uh, stock here to wrap up. You can see at this one corner, a remarkable range of participants. We've got everybody from perhaps a foreign barmaid um, through cloth vendors, uh, somebody who owns, who owns a sizable house up to somebody who was elected as co-mayor of the city. You can also see the number of different ways that people tried to present themselves here on this one little street through their clothing, through their shop signs, through the ritual that played out, through processions, um, through their appearances in person. All of these were forms by which they tried to shape things. And we can also see the remarkable number of realms that collide in this spot. Commerce, religion, uh, hydraulic engineering, uh, politics, industry, leisure, uh, drunkenness, all of these in this one uh, spot. And so one of the points I'm trying to make is that 
These are not just reflections of what happened, but they were intended before they were reflections to be effective in their own world. They were trying to shape the experiences and the perceptions of ancient Pompeians who passed through this space, or more importantly, the ones who lived in this space. And so among this group of neighbors, we have, I think, so anything but a real sort of neighborly sensibility. You get the sense of these people squabbling on an extraordinarily local level, either anticipating people calling out their shortcomings in the case of our neighborhood officials, or actually spelling out their shortcomings in the case of the electoral poetic endorsement that I just talked about, shooting down uh, Barry Kundis's immodest um, proposal. Uh, down the street. And so let me just um, let me just uh, wrap up with uh, a couple of reflections. I want you to look at this particular image. The great urban planning maven, Jane Jacobs, said the following about cities and streets. She said, when you think of a city, you think of its streets. So conjure up in your mind, you know, uh, well, LA, maybe not streets, I was gonna say highways, right? Um, think about uh, New York, you're probably imagining, you know, the canyons of, of Manhattan. If you think of uh, modern day Rome, you're probably thinking of, uh, of streets. Um, this is the same corner from Naples that I showed you at the beginning, only without any people. And this has been the way that we've tended to view ancient Roman streets as sort of like the spaces between all the places that matter. But what I've tried to do today is to breathe those people back into that space to get them interacting with one another and to paint a much more vibrant picture of what happened on the regular spots of urban, uh, of the, the interstitial spots, the places between the ones that we've always studied. And I wanna argue, taking Jane Jacobs' term and sort of adopting it for this one, that when we think of Roman cities, we should also think of their streets. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeremy. Do you wanna take questions? Yeah, of course. And Sarah, do you wanna monitor the-, uh, the... Yeah, let me take it. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Jacobs. <laughs> I'm Sarah James. I'm president of Sorry. the AIA Boulder chapter, and I'm going to help out with the question and answer section here. So if you do have a question for Dr. Hartnett, please do type it into the Q&A. We have a number of questions so far, um, and some thanks for a wonderful presentation, which I think everyone here in the room can echo. Um, right at the beginning of the talk, actually, I thought maybe a good one to start with was um, someone asked a little bit about the history of, of Pompeii, and if you could talk about you know, who discovered this section of the street and, and who studied it, that kind of thing. Yeah. So. Um, Herculaneum, um, what's now lesser known, known was found, discovered uh, first before uh, Pompeii. Uh, Pompeii. But the problem was Herculaneum was under like, like 20 meters of volcanic, volcanic material. material. And so, and so, and if, you and so and if you wanted to dig, you had to basically, had to basically dig, down dig down through 20 meters, uh, 20 meters of, of petrified uh, pyroclastic flow, to use the technical term. So, so when, when a little bit later people, people discovered Pompeii, they realized they only had to dig, dig down, down through about six, six, six meters of much easier, we, much more easily excavatable material. material. So, so the, the focus of the excavators sponsored by the Royal House in Naples transferred from uh, Herculaneum uh, to Pompeii, and then things went gangbusters from there. Um, the the Royal House in Naples was excited to do this because they meant, it meant they got to dig up all sorts of goodies to decorate their, their palace, their nascent museum, uh, et cetera. So they were definitely the ones who sort of uh, bankrolled this uh, initially. And what's fascinating about this history of Pompeii in subsequent generations is that it kept on getting a lot of big bucks poured into it by different um, 
groups who wanted to uh, forge a connection between themselves and Pompeii. So when Italy's becoming a nation state in like the second half of the 19th century, the early Italian nation state is um, pouring all sorts of resources into this to try to uh, pump up the, the sort of archeological patrimony. And in fact, the biggest amount of excavation that's happened in the last 200 years was not the result of uh, Italian nation state at that time, but is instead the fascists, um, Mussolini and uh, other folks who really wanted to see themselves as the rightful heirs, and in fact, the rightful successors of, of the Romans. They call themselves the Terzo Impero, the third empire after the Republic and the, and the Roman Empire, they thought of themselves as the successors. I, I'm happy to, I could go on like for hours on that. So, so why don't I just like stop uh, there and hope that I answer the question. Any questions from the room? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, I have a question about sort of how the street came to be this diverse in terms of the mix, or how, you know, perhaps many times the streets came to be this diverse in terms of the mix of different industries, kind of different functions. You've got this enormous house, you know, in here. Um, and I know that because of the level of preservation, that obviously it's hard to see sort of a more comprehensive archaeology of previous levels, but do we have a sense, like, is there, would this be a neighborhood that perhaps didn't initially have enormous houses, but some kind of transportation, or sort of, you know, people are maybe buying up a lot of smaller houses, making them larger, it's kind of changing over time, is it, is it planned in some way, and then it's been sort of, you know, kind of planned unravels as time goes by? So, for people who are on the Zoom and weren't able to hear, the question boils down to, like, here I've talked about it in like the 70s CE. What can we say about the earlier generations of this neighborhood? Is that my, am I, um, it's tough because we can only analyze in this particular spot the standing architecture. And so people do do all sorts of archaeological or architectural studies of you know where wall joins were and what was built and, and that sort of thing. But there's been a, a, a growing emphasis on discovering the Pompeii of pre-79. And that means excavating in places where there wasn't standing architecture like uh, gardens, uh, for example. And uh, that not much of that has happened in this particular neighborhood, but in that area around the theaters um, in the Southern part of the city, um, a group from the University of Cincinnati headed up by Steve Ellis has spent a lot of time uh, digging uh, there. And I, I they're telling a story that um, of a, of a neighborhood that, that does evolve um, somewhat, um, particularly as, for example, uh, different public buildings get moved in there. We start to see still more attraction of the sort of commercial enterprises lining major streets that we see uh, here as well. Um, I mean, let me take your question in a slightly different direction. You might ask, like, how typical was this? Would be another way to think about it. And um, I think that if you were, if you go to modern day Naples, you can see that there are like these, the streets are not all the same. When you're on these, the short ends, these long diagonal blocks, there's all sorts of activity. And then when you go on to the long sides of the uh, rectangular blocks, suddenly people are like raising chickens and hanging out their laundry and like playing cards, uh, et cetera. And so when you get away from these major arteries, especially ones that connect different gates of the city. I, mean, I think that the commercial stuff is going to die down, right? And there's going to be many fewer uh, doorways, posters, uh, etc. So there were certainly some like quieter corners of the city. And those tended to actually be used for things like um, horticultural plots where people are growing uh, vegetables that they can, um, you know, sell uh, at market nearby. So um, this is I would say representative of like the, the busiest neighborhoods, but doesn't incorporate um, some of the outlying parts of the city. We have a couple more questions um, from online. Let me just take it. Um, one is from someone who was, um, sorry, I'm going to mute, I will unmute. Oh, let me see. You want me to unmute? Okay. All right, well, I want you to mute. <laughs> I think you need to mute. 
Um, so we have a question from someone who was actually at the, the Chantra with you um, back in 2009 and is very excited about this talk. He asks um, about the type of written discourse found on these streets. Was the writing on the walls of these more highly trafficked areas classier than what you might find on less traveled streets? Is there a kind of hierarchy of graffiti? So is there a hierarchy of graffiti? I don't think we can say that. I mean, the, these graffiti are, I would distinguish between two different things. What we've seen are like painted signs. And then there are also things where people would uh, take the plaster like underneath the, um, the depiction of Sibylle and be able to scratch into that plaster with like a, I don't know, a piece of broken pottery or whatever and reveal the white plaster underneath, which would allow them to, to send another uh, message. It's not very far down the street um, where, uh, we know that there was the house. Oh, shoot, I don't think I am. All right, um, all right. So where where there was a house of a another big important person, and someone came by and wrote on it, "Ampliatus, Icarus is buggering you." Um, <laughs> someone, someone, somebody else wrote this, and um, it makes the point that these facades of houses are open to for everyone to they're the one part of the house where everybody can gain access even if they can't make it into the interior parts and so if you can't um like confront somebody face to face you don't have the reason or you may have a reason to but you don't want to one of the things you can do is desecrate their facade um and say all right someone's screwing you over whether it's literally or or figuratively the other thing you can do actually we have some we have records of this elsewhere um but not at pompeii so much uh, aside from that um that sort of graffito that i was talking about is let's say that i'm a, a poor roman and i think that you sarah have done something wrong to me right um i don't have necessarily like legal recourse like you're you're much more powerful you have strings that you can uh pull and so what what am i to do what I might do is round up a whole bunch of my buddies and like get fueled up on wine, go under the cover of darkness, and then shout things at your house door that's closed. Now, you can, um, you may hear these things. Most of these houses are built around courtyards, so you know, it'll be pretty easy to hear these things. But actually, you could prosecute me for slander, even if you're not home, because the key part is not whether you hear it or not, it's whether the rest of the neighborhood uh, hears it. And especially, the, but who would they be pissed off at? Pardon my language. Who would they be upset at if I'm saying, you know, Sarah's a jerk face and I, you know, like my buddies and I are chanting this in the middle of the night, dogs start barking and like people can't sleep. You know, it's going to be you. So even if I can't take you like to court, I could take you to the people's court of the street, right? And, and get my uh, vengeance uh, that way. So that's taking that like, that slanderous graffito on the house facade and like putting a, building a bit of like action uh, around it. Nice. It's a good follow-up actually to another question. Um, keep your mic on. And um, someone asked about the second stories of buildings, which I mean, obviously you would see them here in this picture and sort of what, Uh, largely what you're seeing in front of you is like Spinozola's architectural fantasy. Um, uh, some of this stuff is, is legit. Um, and it's clear that, you know, above our cloth vendors here, there was like a really nice place where people could look out. Um, and uh, that's something I wish that I knew more about. Like what, it definitely is opening up the street to, well, it's, it's breaking down the barrier between interior and exterior in a way that the ground level is oftentimes busy trying to close off, right? If you look at the house plan that we had just a little uh, while ago, for example, you can see that we're up here. There's, you know, this place is trying to insulate itself as much as possible from uh, the street. But those second floor things, because they don't have, they don't, people aren't like threatened that some bozo is going to climb up and jump in, they could be a lot more open. So I'm curious, I'm genuinely curious what, you know, displays people could have uh, there. 
or what they could overhear or what performances they might partial. The truth is though, that I don't really know. We have like little smatterings of, you know, sections from like Livy or anything from Livy to like, uh, I guess, Acts of the Apostles where somebody is on a second floor window and, and hears one of the apostles um, preaching from a nearby uh, spot and they can like uh, oh, tech, tech, figure out what's going on. So, um, uh, and I think it's when like, it's in Livy book one, when one of the, one of the many like evil Etruscan queens, like, um, you know, is trying to cover up something that's going on in, in, in the upper echelons of Roman society politics. And then people hear something coming out of the second floor. So uh, I'm afraid I don't have much of a better answer uh, than that. Largely because we don't have a lot of second floors uh, to, to study, even a place like Pompeii. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Uh, the question is, were female endorsements of politicians common? No, and that's part of the puzzling part about this. We have 50 named uh, endorsements by women throughout the whole city and a solid 10% are right here. So what was it, what was special about these particular women that they endorsed so fervently in this one spot? They don't have the right to vote. You know, these women I've made the case or at least suggested that they were, um, you know, workers in this spot. I mean, it's, it's really perplexing and I don't have a very good um, answer to it. Were they sort of like public figures or let me, if we imagine like social networks, um, even though they were stationary, are people coming in from all of these um, shops and bars, excuse me, shops and houses and everything else and like trading gossip with them. And then they become like the central wagon wheel of a variety of different social networks. So are they like the ones who bridge from one household to another? Uh, even if the, the members of one household or another don't ever see each other, they're the common link. That's a possibility. Um, you know, like I'm, Dimitri mentioned, like I'm trying to figure out how the daily texture of Roman urban life works. And I want to figure out like individual experiences. And for these particular women, I, I could like look sideways and try to figure out, all right, how are they typical of what's going on? And, but when they turn out not to be typical, I mean, how are you to explain that, right? I mean, you like you want, you don't want everybody to like march in lockstep in the ancient world because we know that that's like not the point uh, of the kind of project I'm uh, working on. Where I want to like puzzle out individual texture, um, and so you know, how do you how do you account for people who seem, I don't know, aberrant makes it sound too dismissive, like who don't fit the pattern, right? You gotta like leave some space for the ones who are. Um, doing something special, even though you can't like name what the special thing is that distinguishes them from everybody else. I saw another hand, yeah. Just, I'm curious since we know this is what's you know left in 79 at the eruption, right? And the organic nature of how some of these, these communities grow, knowing that after the earthquake of 62, the Ludus Gladiatorius has moved down to the theater district and this is kind of like the main artery that runs between the theater district mm -hmm. and the amphitheater. Do you think that has caused any of the morphology of this, this community to be so commercial and have these kind of aspects to it? Because I can only imagine the pomp and circumstance that would go along with the gladiators making their march right down to the amphitheater. So. Yeah, so um, let me pull out a slide. So Travis is talking about, we know that the, the Gladiatorial Ludus was up here and then it gets moved down to right behind the uh, theater. So if you have got gladiators down here and they've got to make their way over to the amphitheater, uh, this would be the spot that would make the most sense unless they were to snake along uh, this street here or who knows um, uh, what else. Um, I, you know, that's a good question. And uh, I, I think that the fascinating part is if you compare the length of this street, the Via Dal Abondanza, in this segment, like the half kilometer that um, that Spinazzola excavates, I think there are 22 uh, eating and drinking establishments. Whereas in this segment between the forum and that corner, there's something like three. And so it does suggest that something different is going on here. Whether it's the result of that 
of that movement and that this being like an important tie down to the amphitheater or something else is up for debate. Part of the argument might be that this area on between the forum and the theaters uh, may be special. We know that wheeled traffic was not allowed in that area. And then also, actually, let me go back to, all right, hold on everybody. Um, this is the image that I want right here. Okay, um, here they are, right? All 22 of them. And if we look at the eating and drinking establishments, there are almost none along there. There's no wheeled traffic through this area. And it might've been a processional route between the civic and commercial and religious center of the forum and the other temples and theaters down here. Um, you know, like just look how there aren't any of these dots on the forum. You know, if you go to a European city today and you wanna get a coffee or a beer or a glass of wine, where do you go? You go to the main square right in front of the, the, the Duomo, right? That's the place. And it gives you a sense of how differently Roman sensibilities were attuned. So I'm sort of revealed, pulling back the lie here that I've been um, uh, concealing. I've been saying there's not much zoning. Well, one thing we can say is there's not much zoning, but there's going to be like a degree of magnetism to the main streets. And there may not be zoning where certain things are um, only where only th certain things are permitted, but there may be a degree of like zoning where certain things are not permitted. And it may be like stuff that's in the view of elite Romans, morally questionable uh, along here all for a processional route. At least that's one of the theories that's been floated to why the, there's such a disparity in the number of uh, eating and drinking establishments in those two segments of what's basically the same street. Yes, sir. Um, So the question was, um, what do we know about what happened immediately outside of the, the city? And the initial answer is we kind of know. Um, and what we have are a whole bunch of tombs because Romans didn't bury their dead within the city walls, but wanted to like, they had this sort of sacred boundary around the city that separated, oh, other from us, from the dead, from the living, uh, war from from peace, etc. And so even in this um, illustration, you can see a whole bunch of tombs outside this gate, some up here, and there's a, a boatload uh, going out in the to the northwest because that was one of the busiest uh, roads. Now beyond that, we know a little bit about some suburban sanctuaries. And if you spend any time there and you like talk to people who are local, they're like, oh yeah, we found stuff in our cellar. You know, there's just it's clear that. It's not like the city wall ends and then that's where inhabitation ends. There's gotta be just a whole bunch of suburban uh, stuff uh, surrounding it. Some of those are uh, what, we, what we lump together under the broad category of villas. Now villa, as I'm suggesting, villa could mean anything from like um, rural villa where there's made like one nice room and everything else is like olive press and, you know, and, and half stable slash pig pen. Right. And then other ones that are clearly like up by the overlooking the sea and are like gorgeous, resplendent, like luxury palaces, uh, essentially. So I think we have to that sort of suburban area is um, been the subject of a, a really good recent book by Allison Emerson about uh, the surrounding area, about P Pompeii and other Roman cities. Um, and I think we're starting to learn that this it's as much as the Romans wanted there to be a stark divide between in and out. It's a, it, it's definitely not an on off switch. It's much, very much more a dimmer where, where death is something that just like flashes on as soon as you walk outside the city. But even then, like, I'm sorry, keep going. Even then, like, um, there are these like benches built into some of the tombs right outside the city. So they're meant not just to be like these show pieces for the deceased, but they're meant to accommodate the living who want to get a break from what's in the in the city. And so, like, how do you draw people's attention? You have a distinctive looking uh, funerary monument, or you have one that people want to use, right? That gets you a little shade. That's a nice place to eat. That's a nice place to chill out. Whatever. Yes, sir. Um, so my question is about the, like you mentioned, the, 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 the
Yeah. Is that because of what resources or I think you mentioned that they're still working through what they are what is already there? Or like is there more do you think there's a more important pieces that haven't been found there? So the question was about the unexcavated parts, like the 30% or so, and um, what's there, are we gonna excavate it, et cetera. I mean, like I can answer that like over several different, in several different ways. One is we don't, the archeological superintendency of Pompeii does its very best to maintain what's there, but some of these buildings have been open to the elements since the 1750s, all right? In fact, they probably have stood longer open to the elements in the modern period than they did in the ancient period, all right? And that is just not good for them. Also, you're fighting like, if you go to some of these like outer reaches of the site, they're just getting engulfed by this like fairy tale thicket of, of vegetation um, and you know, freezes and thaws vegetation. This is just not good. So if they're, if, and with, with every piece of plaster that falls off the walls, we're losing every part of a mosaic that pops up. We're losing important archeological evidence, right? And so if we have limited resources, which we do in this world, right? We, um, uh, shouldn't we, the argument goes, shouldn't we concentrate on maintaining those particular uh, things? That's one of the arguments. Now, at the same time, you might say, like, if you wanna generate a whole lot of funds and attention, just like singing this sad song about the deterioration of the site is not exactly, you know, it's, it's like a save the children campaign, right? We, and I'm not sure it's gonna be the most effective. And so what archeological superintendency has done in recent years is to like do some strategic cleaning around the edges. So right up in this part of the site uh, is the source of a whole bunch of things that have come out in the last oh, two years or so another fantastic eating and drinking establishment. It doesn't look like any of the rest of them that you've seen. Maybe you saw it uh, uh, in, in class. And like, you're, you, you kind of got to the point of the question, like uh, what's still lurking underneath there? And you see that stuff and it comes on so beautiful. You think, holy smokes, wouldn't it be awesome to see still more things uh, like that. But, you know, the counter argument is the resource argument. And the other counter argument is the volcano argument which is, this is a volcanologically and seismologically uh, active zone. Maybe Mount Vesuvius, not so much, not likely to be a, a threat, um, but there are earthquakes that happen pretty regularly. The last major one was in um, 1980 and the Northwest part of the Bay of Naples, they call it the burning fields for a reason, right? It is like in 1537, a mountain grew up overnight. The, the, the water seems to, sea level seems to rise and fall because the ground is moving up and down on a big honking um, pillow of pillows, a little too soft, uh, uh, toiling cauldron of magma. All right, uh, so, um, <laughs> um, so there's a danger this whole thing could be, you know, buried uh, again. And when it'd be more safe to have these things be stable underground rather than to excavate some more. The real, like um, hot place for a uh, discussion about this is, is Herculaneum more than Pompeii because in the suburbs of Herculaneum was found this grand, grand villa, the Villa of the Papyri, so-called because there are all of these ancient texts that were found in an ancient uh, library. And a lot of people want to say, want are, are in the Sarah Palin style dig baby dig camp for, to find more of those uh, of those goodies. And other people are saying, hold your horses. Like we've got to maintain what we've got. In fact, this has triggered a big project at Herculaneum of, of consolidating what uh, has been excavated uh, through the called the Herculaneum Conservation Project headed up by the British school in Rome, which has become really a, a model for um, uh, for a, a broad path forward. So it's a really complex question. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it, yeah, it's really complex. Um, thank you.
thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, I hope that many people will join us for our next talk on um, May 4th and um, join us perhaps with the plastics department for Brian Rose's um, talk on Monday um, about museums in the 21st century. But again, a very, very warm thanks and gratitude to Dr. Hartnett for sharing his wonderful research with us tonight on Pompeii. Thank you all.